very awesome folks from the events industry. If you're not familiar with event icons, um, we do this weekly with Will Curran. Um, and it's where we interview the coolest people from around the events industry. It happens every week and we have a different guest or a number of different guests talking about everything from technology to trends. Um, and so really for everybody out there in uh, Blab land, it's your chance to have a co casual conversation and learn a little bit more about what your event profs counterparts are doing in the industry. Um, and so really they're here to answer all of your questions. So uh, throughout the broadcast, we invite you to hop into the chat. If you hit forward slash Q, then type in your question. Um, we'll answer those questions throughout. And of course, if you're enjoying today's session, um, be sure to do us a favor, get us a bigger audience, and tweet out uh, that you are attending the session. So without further ado, um, I am going to go ahead and introduce my two esteemed guests of the hour. Um, the first guest that we have today is David Epstein, who is the content marketing manager of Bizaboo. Um, he is a content marketing and brand building expert uh, focused on building a marketing machine to help educate event planners about different SaaS solutions, namely Bizaboo. Um, so David, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice uh, to talk nice to you. Talk. Oh, sorry, there's an echo happening. Um, anyway, so I'm very excited to talk event marketing with all of you and uh, look forward to your questions. Awesome. And our second guest of the hour is Kristen Carvalho, who just joined, uh, who joined eTouches in November 2013. She is their senior content and social media manager. And uh, she is the best person to speak with with all questions regarding social media and content. Um, and so she's really charged with setting and executing all of eTouch's social media and content strategies to help support their fantastic marketing team over there at eTouch's. So Kristen, do you wanna say a couple of words? Yeah, hi everybody. I'm happy to be here today. Really excited to uh, be on the Event Icon Show. I've seen it for a while. I'm excited to chat with both of the great people that are that are in here right now and all of you out there about content, marketing, um, and everything events. Awesome. So again, just another quick reminder for everybody who just joined in. Um, you can ask any and all of your questions using the chat box using slash forward slash Q and then type in your question and we'll get through them. So I do have a list of questions of my own to go through. So first of all, uh, what got you both into the events industry? David, you want to go first? Oh, sure. Oh, okay. Um, Good question. Actually, I read an article um, on Fast Company about how to build a company culture in two different, like across continents, because Visibo has an office in New York where I'm based, or in marketing, sales, customer successes. We also have an office where we started in Israel, um, where our developers are, where our co-founders are from. And I was kind of thinking about transitioning, I was a consultant, like a business consultant before. And the article really interested me, the philosophy they communicated. And so I reached out and they happened to be hiring for a marketing person. And as fate would have it, here I am. Great. Awesome. Uh, so I actually started my career in uh, the video production side of content. So content was something that always interested me and I was trying to find an industry that really fit. I really loved producing content that made a difference for people. Uh, the place that I worked prior produced um, happiness videos and happiness content and, and spread it across the world. And uh, I found, uh, I didn't really know that the event industry was as big as it was honestly before I started here. Um, I think it's something that a lot of people probably say. And um, I, I joined the team and about six months into eTouches, I uh, was asked to speak at the meeting show in the UK. And once I went there, that's when I really kind of fell in love with uh, events because I, I saw how great of a community it was and how excited people were about everything that they were doing and how collaborative it was, you know, different people who were who were leaders in their respective space, um, just kind of talking and, and chatting with other people. And I got to meet some really great people that I'm still connected with today. And I think really helped me to, um, you know, further my career in content and, and help spread it to everybody else. Awesome. I have a follow up question to that. Uh, can you tell me about what happiness content entails? 
<laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it was it was an awesome pl place to be a part of. Uh, if you kind of think of uh, Upworthy, it, we were we were kind of produced a lot of content like that. So finding amazing stories of people across the country and we would produce videos for them. So we would hire videographers and and have them go to where that person was. Um, it was just really inspiring. There's so many stories that you would never even imagine exist for people um, and such amazing things that people do from Connecticut to California to, uh, you know, Texas and everywhere in between. Um, and some of those people we still keep in touch with, I still keep in touch with today. And I think it kind of, it, it makes me have a different perspective on even the content that I produce now as a B2B content marketer, um, because I think you need to know that every single piece that you produce is how it's going to affect the person who's reading it and how it's going to make their life better. So it might not be a total happiness content, but I'm sure when someone you reads, you know, something that I created or something that David created or something that you created, um, you know, someone's actually going to be like, oh, I can actually use this in my real life. So it's a way that is a happiness content in a B2B way, I guess. <laughs> awesome. And then to that end, um, can you all tell me a little bit more about what you all do at your respective companies? And I guess, David, we'll start with you this time. Cool. Um, yeah, great question. Um, it ranges for, you know, it's a lot of different things. Uh, first and foremost, I run the blog and all of the content that goes with that. So webinars and eBooks and white papers, uh, all of that stuff. Um, SEO and social media, it's also part of my uh, responsibilities and also uh, PR and relation, you know, partnerships. Um, so those are, those are mostly the things that I, I take care of. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, I feel like I could just be like ditto because it's <laughs> um, pretty much the exact same thing on my end. Uh, manage all of the blog content and work with outside writers and inside writers. The blog content is kind of my baby. I, kind of, I grew it kind of when I started here. Um, but then again, do all of our social media efforts, um, PR that we do, um, any type of larger content pieces that we create, whether we write them internally or work with external, um, you know, content producers to help to help do that as well. Um, and kind of work with a team of other marketing and content producers, um, as well at eTouches uh, to really kind of create a holistic marketing strategy. I have a question for you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. You said the blog's your baby. I feel yes. <laughs> similarly. And I imagine you, you know, with your time there, it's changed, you know, since taking over. So how's it changed from when you started to now? I would say from, well, when I started, everybody was only writing, it was only internal writers, which I think that's a whole thing. And it's probably what we'll get into today talking about content marketing. You really have to think about, you know, your reach and expanding. Um, so when we started, it was purely internal and we probably got less than, I would say 9,000 unique views, maybe a year. Um, definitely less than, not even, I would guess. Uh, and from when I started, uh, we kind of grew and created a whole new community of writers that are regulars, either regulars on our blog or finding different people, you know, in the industry or associations or at events um, that have written for us. So I've really seen it grow into just kind of a company blog to something that's becoming, I at least I think, and I, and I think for a lot of our respective companies, we could probably all say that has like we're all kind of becoming bigger thought leaders in this industry. So it's yeah. not just, um, you know, kind of those individual event planners who have made a great name for themselves. It's also really great companies who are providing amazing technology solutions, um, but also kind of backing it up with all of their industry knowledge and showing that, you know, they're working with other people to, to spread that message as well. So I've seen it. I mean, it's, it's changed totally. And I'm, I'm sure you could probably say the same thing about your blog because you guys have produced amazing pieces of content and even larger ones as well from, um, I know you guys have done a lot of white papers and eBooks too. Yeah. So. yeah. No, I, I feel like we're mirrors almost and that <laughs> we, we can say the same thing. You know, uh, the Bisabo blog has really grown um, exponentially in the last year, especially a lot of white papers and stuff. And for me, it was um, making things that an uh, event planner could read. And at the end of it, they could actually do something new you know, and really put it into place and make it actionable and maybe less fluffy, you know, less, maybe it's not as, you know, quick to read, but it really is supposed to reward someone for, for reading it. Yeah, and I totally I'm, agree with that. I'm sure social tables 
can say the same thing. Also, you guys, I've noticed, have a lot of cool free tools to help people in the industry. Like that, that's super cool. Um, so yeah, I think one thing that works really well, since we're all coming from a content background, um, it's so much easier to be helpful to somebody than to try and sell them something. So mm -hmm. you know, if you can provide a useful piece of content, maybe you don't get the sale now. Maybe you don't ever, but it's definitely a good way to get somebody familiar with their brand, I think, through content. So, awesome. Um, we got a question in from the crew at Crowd Mics. Hey, everybody, thanks for joining. Um, so both of you mentioned white papers and long form, long tail content. So the question from Crowd Mics is, how much time do you spend creating a piece of content, like a guide or a white paper? Kristen, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I think it it varies on on the different types. A white paper is going to take a lot more time. Uh, when we do it, we usually do surveys. Um, even when we work with outside um, content producers or providers, usually takes about uh, eight to ten weeks if we do something like that. When it's going to involve research and if you're going to interview people, um, if it's a how to or a guide. I would say probably half the time um, because again, it's going to be internal research. You can use a lot, utilize a lot of resources you have. I think it really depends on what you're speaking about. If it's something that, like, uh, I know I know technology, but I'm not going to say I'm an expert in beacon technology or a lot of mobile mobile software. So if I were to write something on that, that would take me a little bit longer than something if I was talking about social media or content. Um, because with something like that, I would have to go to someone else on my team to kind of get their expert op opinion and advice. So. I don't know if it's similar for you, David, or if you guys yeah. kind of have a different timeline. Yeah, well, the your point about the surveys is true. I mean, any kind of report, the time is extended because you need to collect the feedback. And that's a mini marketing project in itself, just getting enough people to make the results statistically significant. And then um, writing, we, you know, when we started, when I started, the production time was like four weeks or six weeks. Now we've taken it to two weeks, um, which is great. Um, and we have used Trello a lot, actually, as a task right. management tool to monitor and manage external writers, internal writers, making sure they work together with our design team and all that stuff. But I think it's a similar timeline overall. Yeah. Good question, though. I love Trello. Trello is great. We, we use that social tables. Um, so... Same thing, a sort of follow up. Um, you both mentioned that you use outside writers for their expertise. Mm -hmm. um, so my question to both of you is how do you find and manage outside writers? How do you keep them engaged? Is there, you know, how do you go about asking somebody, hey, be a writer for our blog and here's yeah. why you want to do that? That's a good question too. I guess I'll start. Um, you know, it, it is hard because there are a lot of writers out there and there aren't a lot of awesome event planning writers, um, I've, at least for, from what I've found. And we use Upwork a lot to try and at least get an introduction to someone who's a good writer. And to me, it's more important that they have great writing ability and then we can introduce them to an expert or you know, have, you know guide them to research and become an expert on their own or do a mixture of those things. But what I've found is having someone who can actually write well is pretty difficult. So once we find that, that's kind of where we start from and we'll try and you know get the expertise um, through other connections we have with event planners and, and or things like that. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's, it, it is really hard finding a, a really great writer and somebody who I, I think with events, especially it's, it's such a hard industry to grasp. I think um, if you're not in it and you're charged with, um, for example, if you're creating a white paper and you're working with just a, you know, a firm that that's what they do. They, they're a marketing firm that produces white papers, eBooks, things like that. And you gave them the topic of event, um, you know, event marketing and you expect them to produce something great, but they're not from the industry, so it's really hard. So I think it is finding that expert. Um, it's, it's having the great writer, but then having the expert to work alongside them to yeah. kind of guide them along the way and and, and show them the process and how things work. Um, because it's there's a, there's a, there's there are great great writers, but not great writers that maybe have the time to write all those long form pieces that you want as a B2B company. Um, 
but we rely on, I mean, some internal writers, some of our internal experts to help with those external writers. So we have a really accessible um, executive team that's been in the industry for many years that is always willing if we have something like that, where we need an expert on mobile or we need someone that's talked, that's been in associations and to create a piece on that, that can really work with our external writers and, and produce some, some great pieces. So great segue into my next question is how do you both handle marketing at your respective companies? So so for you, Kristen, you pull in um, any of your um, executive team if you need their expertise and you have a team of writers. Um, you know, how big are your teams? How do you all manage, um, you know, content creation, social media? Um, how is that managed at both of your, your companies and how big is the team that you're working with? Uh, I'll go. I'll go first. Uh, so our team has grown a lot. Our marketing team. It, when I started, we have two different sides of our team. So we have a digital side and we have a content and event side. And our content and event sides. When I started, it was just three of us. <laughs> so it was it was really small, and we've grown a lot. And I think I think um, a lot of the companies in the industry have in the last couple of years, and, and really expanded, which is which is great for our industry. Um, but now we have, um, you know, I have a, we have a content producer that also works on our team who's strictly tasked with just copywriting and writing a lot of our, of our content pieces that we do externally that are a little bit shorter. So those how to, those guides, cheat sheets, things like that. Um, and then we have, like I said, we work with some external partners that we, we worked with for a couple of, a couple of years around different projects that, that help us on things like creating infographics or creating eBooks, things like that. And working with our, VP of marketing, who has been extremely influential in a lot of our marketing that we produce, um, because all of our content pieces that we create go into any digital campaigns that we have going out there. So, um, I mean, obviously we want to produce great thought leadership content to the industry, um, but we also want to help our business in the end as well. So we're making, making sure that we're producing pieces that have a purpose and that we're not just producing stuff to produce stuff. Um, I think it's, it really stands that quality over quantity, um, cause you can have a, a, a bunch of these really large pieces, but it might not mean anything if it does, if it's not going to actively help your uh, organization or someone in the industry. Um, but that's, I mean, that's kind of it. Our, our marketing team is now global as well. So we have people that work, we have a whole product side that does all of our product marketing. Um, I do kind of the best practice, I guess you would say marketing. Um, so kind of tips, how to's. And then we have the digital side um, and we have a team now in Australia. So it's, it's pretty wow. great kind of having it on, on all globes and be able to create some more local content too for some people at different industry in regions. Cool. Very what interesting. What about you? Yeah, so we approach it um, like a project. Each marketing initiative is its own project, and there's a team of anywhere between two to five different people on a project. Um, and so there's a kickoff meeting, and that's where goals are discussed. Basically, when it comes to, if you know, let's start with an example. So if we're trying to write an ebook, the goals, first of all, is educating the community with something they didn't probably know about before. So there's a lot of research before the kickoff meeting to see what's out there um, already, what's already very popular. And if that already exists, then we'll think of a new topic. So we'll have something that's unique. And then we'll come to that meeting knowing that we want to, okay, educate event planners, of course, you know, introduce them to Bizabo in a way. So there's always something at the end of an ebook that talks about Bizabo so that an organizer can learn more. That's pretty standard. And we'll have a number of kind of people who we want to download the ebook and a number of new people who we want to download. So in, in mind as well. And that fits into our company goals and our, and you know, metrics in a quarter and in a month. So that's where it begins. Then we'll end up kind of writing that. So typically, we have an, either an in-house, you know, we have two in-house writers or we have a team of five other writers who are either freelancing or interning or working for us remotely uh, in the US. And so it will typically be me and that writer kind of creating an outline and then submitting that outline to an expert if we need that or internally we'll decide. And then we'll, you know, ha then they'll fill it in, of course, and it goes to design. So we have a design team that's kind of separate from our marketing. They also do product. Um, and so they sit between that. 
And so we'll design it. And then of course, there's a whole lead gen process with, you know, our uh, Emma Borokov, uh, our, you know, marketing director who's doing lead gen work and um, she'll, you know, set up the landing pages for that and decide if it d deserves paid promotion and things like that. And then we'll let it run for, you know, an agreed period of time and then we'll revisit it and decide, okay, what was successful? Was it successful at all? What was successful about it? You know, learnings for next time. And that's kind of the process for all the projects just seen through an ebook. Wow. Yeah, I think I think the most important thing that you said is the last point is that looking at all of the content pieces that you create, um, which I think everybody has to do. I think a lot of people like create stuff. It's like when people say set it and forget it, which you should never right. do. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's the same thing. People create pieces, but then don't look at what if it was successful, if it did anything, if you received any leads from it, or if you got a bunch of shares on social media or anything. Um, I think that's that's a big downfall when people don't do that. And I yeah. think it's extremely important for, for content. So how does, it, how does it work at social tables? And is it similar or different? It's very similar. Um, we have a very small but mighty team. Um, our marketing communications team only has five people. It's myself, I'm the community manager. Um, we have a digital marketing manager, a content marketing manager, a marketing operations manager. So he's really our Salesforce administrator um, when it comes to leads that we get. So any content that generates leads from a landing page, for example, um, you know, how do we score those leads? Are they high quality leads? Are they people that you know probably just want to download the content, consume it, and then move on? Um, so, and then we have our CMO, so just five people. Um, so when it comes to content, um, we're very deliberate about how we create our content. So if we have, for example, um, we have a five city roadshow. So we're gonna Ooh, create okay. content. Yeah, we're gonna create content that leads up until that big event. And so we'll repeat that and see, you know, how did we do with um, our email campaigns, organic social media, paid, um, and see, you know, maybe we should have pushed out that email sooner for the next city. So it's great because we can very quickly templatize everything that we're doing. Um, because we are such a small team, uh, we do have to kind of make things that work repeatable. And then the things that don't work, we just scrap it. Um, we were talking a little bit about um, outside writers. So we have a, a ton of outside writers that we work with. Um, so we look to them for their expertise also, kind of like what Kristen mentioned. I love that you mentioned Beacon Technology because I know nothing about it. <laughs> I have used it, but I've never, I, I couldn't write a 700 word blog post to save my life. No. Um, but we have <laughs> a, a guy, he's uh, the event nerd, Damani Daniel, who hopefully he's logged on. Damani, if you're out there, <laughs> hey, what's up from social tables? Um, he He's an expert at it and he knows a lot about it. He knows a lot of great resources you can throw into a blog. So, um, so it's more of a, a holistic approach. You know, what can we keep doing that's working um, and how, if something is working, how can we test it and try it again to get better results? Um, but yeah, we have a pretty small team and it's just, uh, it's not really any one person out for themselves. We all work pretty cross-functionally. So yeah, uh, five people is a grip. Yes, you are right, crowd mics. <laughs> um, there's a great question that came in from Melissa, um, our lady over at eTouches. Um, she had a question about, actually, let me see. Uh, let me get rid of that question. Do you think content marketing requires a large budget? And I would tack onto that, why or why not? Great question. Kristen, do you wanna yeah. take it first? I mean, uh, sure. Cool. I, I think simply, no, I don't think you need a huge budget for content marketing. Obviously, if you have a huge budget, you can do a ton of stuff. And um, I think we can all think of a couple of big people in our industry who have huge content marketing budgets and they do a lot of stuff. But I don't think that means that the people who have smaller budgets or, or smaller companies or have smaller teams produce content that's not as great. Um, I think you can still, it Matt, you have to specifically choose the pieces that you're going to choose that are going to be those large pieces of content that are going to cost I don't know, $10,000 if you need to produce it, if you work with somebody outside and you want to create that real expert piece that's going to be research driven. Um, but I think a lot of stuff you could do internally. If you have, we talked about having great writers and how it can be hard, but if you have a really great writer um, that knows a topic or you can utilize a lot of experts within your own company, 
that you can create great content pieces. Maybe you won't be able to push them, at, um, you know, advertise them in as many places as you would like, um, because obviously a lot of stuff is paid advertising. Um, but you can you can kind of do it organically and and see what your reach is there. And then once you get kind of more stuff going, um, I, I think your reach can be great. It's just it just depends. So no, I don't think you need a large budget online. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, similarly. I actually think that some of the companies in our industry and others that have the biggest budget budgets generally don't produce the best content necessarily um, mm -hmm. because I, I'm not sure why, but I think when you have a smaller budget, you're kind of forced to be honest with your readers and just share what you know. And I find that there's, you know, kind of more quality in that. Like um, Groove HQ is a software, I think it's uh, I forget what it is exactly. I think it's like a ticket resolution platform. And when they started out, they were writing mostly about what it's like to be a SaaS company. Um, and they serve SaaS companies, uh, among others, and what it's like to be a startup. And that's their customer base also. So what ended up happening was they didn't have a lot of money. So the, one of the co-founders was the author. And he was writing about his story as a founder. Um, and his articles are awesome and they're evergreen because they're so transparent into what it's really like to you know struggle as a startup and to see success and i think actually the similar kind of thing has happened at bizabo at least and you know in that when we started we had limited budget and that was like two two and a half years ago and so all we could do was you know grab an event planning friend or write about what we know about marketing and kind of make it honest. And now, fortunately, we've grown in that direction so that, you know, things continue to be good. Um, short answer, I guess it doesn't, no, it, it doesn't require a budget. It's easier with a budget, um, but sometimes it's a blessing in disguise, not having one. All right, great answers here. Um, so one question that was posted by Crowd Mics, which I'm very interested to know, from both of you, what has been your most popular post ever? And um, to my Crown Mics crew out there, I'm assuming this this could be a combination of what's your most popular ebook, white paper, organic social post, um, video. If you're doing videos, um, yep. Okay, cool. So <laughs> any any and all of the above. I'll let you go first. <laughs> cool. All right. Actually. Uh, this is a great question, um, and it's something that you know we're always looking at with our internally to see what our readers are enjoying. So, so far in in just in a rolling one year period, the most popular post has been an explanation as to why women's events, like women's only business events, have been popular lately. So that's got. You know, thousands and thousands of visitors. Part of it is, I guess, we rank well organically for that, so it's very discoverable and it's evergreen, I guess. Oh, actually, it might not be. It's actually quite timely. Um, and it people like sharing it on social media and in email and stuff like that. So, you know, that, that took us by surprise when we published it. We thought it would do well because we published it, of course, but we didn't realize how well it would do. And sometimes that's the way it works. Was there a post that you thought was going to be way more popular? And then yeah. this one sort of let me, yes, actually yeah, wrote, jumped on the list. That's a great question. So we wrote this post on 50 podcasts for startup. Yes. <clears throat> and it's just kind of like a, not related to the event industry at all, but we have a lot of organizers, who use us, who are innovators or startups or tech, you know, interested in tech. So we wrote it with kind of that audience in mind. And also if you happen to just enjoy that stuff, you would find it valuable. So that post hasn't done as well as I thought it would because we have like really awesome podcasts on there that I at least like listening to big followings and it's kind of a broad topic and it's just not that popular. Um, but I'll keep pushing it. I'm going to keep sharing it. And maybe this will be the boost it needs. And finally, it will become super popular. You should share the link so we can all make it your first okay. most popular post. How can I? All right, I'll Move over women's event. Well. <laughs> more popular posts. That's right. On, on Bizaboo's blog. Yeah. Great. What about you, Kristen? 
What's your most popular post ever? Well, I think one of our, I mean, we have a couple of posts I think that have done really well that have surprised me. Um, one of our, our kind of our most popular posts are some of the posts that you might think are the most basic, I think, that are some stuff that I don't think we're going to get a huge reach. Um, one of them being, we had one that was a post that was what I wish I knew when I was starting my career as an event planner. And that did wide, hugely, hugely well. Um, awesome. So many people are still sharing it. It's And it's kind of basic. It's just tips for somebody who's getting started in the industry, who maybe is going to school and isn't too sure. Um, but it did really, really well um, organically. Thinking socially, just because I do manage social as well, uh, our CEO won an award uh, in the New York area uh, with Smart CEO. And we posted it on LinkedIn and it probably got the most clicks, likes, shares, comments ever in existence for us on LinkedIn. And I just posted it because it's, you know, you won an award, you normally post it. I don't think you expect to get a lot of um, things if it's just a link going back to that. We didn't have anything on our website. It wasn't anything big. Um, and we were really pleasantly surprised by that. I think he was presently, presently surprised by that as well, um, just because we've done some stuff for him before and it hasn't reached that height. So I think sometimes you don't expect what's going to happen, but there's a lot of posts on our blog that are that are kind of have been really well. We did one on event food that's done really well. Um, that oh, was picked cool. up a couple of places. Um, yeah, that was like a huge one about how to create better event food options for people. And everybody loved that one. It was actually written by uh, one of our outside writers, Trevor Liu um, from MPI in Toronto, um, which some of you guys might know. He's awesome. He writes amazing posts and it did amazing. So <laughs> we thank him for that. <laughs> Uh, but is that was probably room? is he in the room? No, I know. I wish he was in the room. <laughs> yeah, we're talking him up here. <laughs> exactly. Great. But and yeah. then you mentioned something um, just now, um, featuring employees or um, you know fellow people in the industry. Um, how often do you all do that? Since some of you, I think both both of you guys do organic social, correct? David, yeah. do you? You do. Okay. Yeah. How often do you feature um, internal content? Yeah. on your blogs or on social yeah so that's a that's a great question and it's something we're actually doing increasingly a uh, great amount of as we grow we have more voices in the company um so recently we're a lot of our developers have actually been writing about best practices and things like that they they're an awesome team a lot of cool experience you know working for other companies and themselves and many of them as you know uh, in the Israeli uh, you know army as you know uh, in the cyberspace so they're super experienced and they're they're just writing to mostly other developers which is a new audience but it's really helpful when we're trying to do recruiting and marketing in that way so we're increasingly sharing their content on um, on Twitter and LinkedIn and they typically write LinkedIn pulse articles which I think is a good medium for that kind of content because it's personal and professional and it's related to business and not just Bizabo, but it includes us, of course. So that's happening. Um, and also now our sales team and our customer success teams, which have so much experience with customers and solving their, you know, each customer has a unique solution and a unique event planning needs and, our team has a lot of experience solving those, you know, creating the right kind of platform and just for their needs. So, and thinking about their needs creatively. So they're starting to write stuff um, also for, for our blog and also for Pulse, uh, which is a good solution for, I think, for some of their, that content. Great. Yeah, I totally agree. A lot of our, um, it's funny that you ended with that because that's what I was going to say. A lot of our, our sales team, it's it's become a big initiative for them um, in 2016 and our account management team to um, create more posts and write more posts. We have we have a couple. We have three people I can think of off the top of my head and right now, one in the U.S., one in the U.K., and one in Australia who are really big on kind of writing their own content or sharing their own stuff with the industry. Um, and we try to promote them and push them as much as we can. Um, whether it's a, a blog post that they write, many of them do write on LinkedIn post uh, Pulse, excuse me, which I think is I think that's a that's a great uh, medium to write uh, just in general because you get out to a whole new wider audience. Um, and it's nice that it pops up in the corner uh, when one of your 
one of, one of your connections is actually writing something, someone mm -hmm. you may have forgotten about, but they've written some great piece and you're able to connect with them again as well, which I think is really beneficial. Um, so we, we always push that content out and we're trying to do more as well with our internal team when it comes to video content. Uh, so that's that's a big initiative for 2016 is to do a lot more stories from within our team who, again, have had a lot of experience in the industry or experience with customers that can really share stories that us and the marketing team might not have, you know, the knowledge or experience to talk about ourselves. So. Hmm. Cool. And then um, great point there. Um, using content to sort of empower your teams. So how does content play a part in not just your marketing strategy, but for your sales team strategy and your customer success strategy? Um, I guess I'll start. So that's a great question. Actually, that was a big initiative that we uh, you know, kind of led 2016 with because there's a lot of data out there that supports content and social selling as a means to make new relationships with your customer or potential customer. Um, I think Forrester Research has a lot of awesome case studies that I, I recommend that people take a look at. I can share later in, uh, for, for the notes. Um, anyway, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot to be said for relationship building through content and just kind of beginning a conversation by providing value instead of asking for a favor in the, in the form of, do you want to schedule a demo or can I tell you about the solution? Instead, it's a kind of higher level conversation. And it's great because you can be perceived as a thought leader, especially because we have so much to share. I'm sure actually both of you, and you know, e-touches and social tables um, incorporate that. I see that all the time in social media and, and anyway. Yeah, so definitely something we're, we're looking at. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, content is, I mean, it's part of our marketing strategy. It's, it's a huge part of our marketing strategy. But when it comes to our sales team, uh, there we really try to create pieces that um, exactly they can utilize for a kind of a softer touch point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same could be sent, said for someone who's planning an event. An event. Um, instead of just kind of sending that first email that's like, register for my event, uh, maybe starting off with something a little bit slower with like content that you had from last year's events so they can kind of get a taste of what it's like, experience it without you kind of doing a real hard sell on them and pushing that, I don't know, thousand dollar ticket that, it take, that it's going to cost you to get to that event or whatever. Um, and, and we do that with even if we have, um, you know, uh, prospective leads that we're trying to reach out to instead of saying, like you exactly like you said, have a demo with us, uh, you know, hey, we produce this great white paper on event ROI. Why don't you have a look? Um, and then similarly, you know, it, it mentions e-touches within the paper, but it's not the huge focus. It's being mm -hmm. seen as a thought leader. And then they'll remember when it comes time for them to buy or to look for something. Oh, hey, I remember I looked at a couple of these people that didn't weren't just trying to sell me. They created these great content pieces or something that I actually was able to use without buying them. Um, and I think that's extremely important. And our sales team also uses a lot of our um, case studies that we produce. And I'm sure, again, it's probably similar on both of your ends as well. That's a huge I think That's a content piece sometimes that people forget about as part of uh, the content strategy. But it's it's creating a story and experience about what you're selling, because you can tell someone all day how great you how great your software is or how great your platform is. But it's not going to matter as much as if it comes from someone who's actually using it, who's kind of a biased party. Um, yes, they use you. So hopefully, and you're going to pick the people probably who are most happy mm -hmm. with your solution. But I think it's a, it's a really natural way to use it. And our sales team use those a lot um, kind of when they're, when they're talking with clients or trying to help them, um, you know, with something different that they're learning about in our software. Yeah, we use case studies all the time. And um, our case studies are, um, we have some of them that are stored on Salesforce. So we, that is our CRM. Yep. Um, so there's a way that you can store those files. So it's super easy for somebody on the sales team to just do a quick search for maybe it's a particular client type. They can do a quick search for those types of case studies um, and then find them easily. So we try to make it super accessible for people to find the content and use it um, because it's worked on our end, too. So that's a good um, tip, actually that I'm glad I heard that. That's awesome. Great idea yeah. because <laughs> it is a challenge. Salesforce? We do. I use we use Salesforce, yeah, and it and it is a challenge to you know as a marketer, it's easy for us to think of content first, and we know what's published. But we have, we're you know we have the pulse of what's going on there, but 
for a salesperson, that's a much, that's a big mind, you know, that's a big deal to change their mindset and think about content from, you know, the customer and getting it to align is, you know, what a big, that's a big focus for, for us in 2016. So anyway, personally, that's great to hear. Thanks for that. Um, I'll give you, I'll give you welcome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so on that same note, that, that actually brings up a good point. Um, what do you all do to make sure that your teams know that, hey, this big ebook is coming out, share it. It's the biggest one we've done. We have the biggest names in the industry. How do you make sure that everybody is informed and that they are sharing and utilizing that content to its full extent? Making sure it doesn't collect dust somewhere in a Google Drive folder. <laughs> No, exactly. I'm actually really excited about that question. Uh, I mean, yes, you want them to, to push your content because I think your company are your best advocates um, to, to promote stuff for you. So we always send um, we send a monthly email with kind of the biggest stuff that we have going out there. And I think one thing that's daunting for a lot of people, too, is like, uh, how am I going to push this? Like, I don't know anything about this. How am I going to write it on Twitter, I don't, I'm not an expert in writing in 140 characters and summarizing a huge book. Um, so I think that's one of the most important things that we do is we send them out, you know, a monthly email that kind of has everything in there with some templated tweets if they just, you know, want to kind of set, send them out and push it to their to their clients or anyone that way. And we kind of tell them how they can use it as well. So if we have a new guide that came out, oh, if you have a, if you have a customer who's asking, um, you know, quick tips for registration, we just came out with a guide. This is this is a perfect thing to use. Um, but something else that we use is and I was going to mention it later on, but I'll mention it now uh, is we use this platform called Bamboo, which is actually um, part of Sprout Social. So it's a new function that came out at the end of middle or end of last year. And it's employee advocacy tool. So there's a couple of other ones out there, but I really like that this one, you can um, you can have a bunch of team, you can have a whole team together on there po posting all of your content. So you can create different categories. So it could be stuff that's internal content that you know your company is producing. It can be stuff about your competitors. So competitive intel, knowing what's going on in the industry. Maybe it's just content topics. If you have a salesperson who wants to get you know, become more active and vocal in their community. Um, and then we push stuff out to them that way and they get it in an email digest so they can see it weekly. So if we have new stuff that we're pushing out or from that large ebook we created, we made a small maybe infographic or blog post, it's kind of thrown in there. So if we already missed that month email that we sent everything out in, um, they can kind of still get it that way. And it's and it's been, it's worked really well. We really like it kind of internally to use um, just as a marketing team, but then also pushing it out to our sales team that are vocal and even our executives having them on there as well awesome tips that's great um so for us the sales and marketing teams are really close physically and also operationally so first of all it's in the same like office building and it's pretty easy to go and say like to get on you know the sales team calendar and say okay i'm gonna you know lead the sales team meeting for the first 10 minutes and break down the newest things and kind of verbally just explain basically what's happened in the last few weeks and what's going to happen. So one thing I've found to be useful is to, you know, and this is probably relevant, not just for people in SaaS, but event planners too, is just when you're trying to update your team about something that's upcoming, giving them heads up is easier than telling them that it already happened. And because it makes them feel more like an owner, at least that's my hypothesis. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's a tip there. Um, and then so getting and scheduling a meeting, if you can, is a lot better for our culture than sending an email um, just in terms of engaging with people and making eye contact and, and fielding questions right there. So there's that. We also have a place internally for all of these resources to kind of live so that you know, not on Salesforce, but uh, Laura, that's a great tip, actually. Um, but somewhere else so that they can pull them when they want to. Um, so there's that. And then also the way that we we do our, our weeks is that um, everyone in our office in New York is involved in a kind of stand up meeting um, first and last of the week. So that's a great kind of time, again, to reiterate company goals and as i was saying that you know content and social selling has become a company goal for for this year at least this quarter 
um, it's a good forum to update everyone. So sales, but also customer success. And beyond that, our co-founders, who two of which two of whom are are in New York. So again, to they have awesome platforms, amazing, you know, group of followers. So they're very valuable as well. Laura, how do you do it? Because, you know, just as much as Visibo or eTouch as you guys have a lot of content to share. So what's what's the strategy for you? So for us, um, we find that repeating, well, not repeating to the point ad nauseum, but making sure that content is inserted as many places as it can be where it makes sense. So, um, for example, you mentioned that you have a stand-up meeting. Um, we used to have an all, a company all hands meeting when we were really small. We're at sitting, we're sitting at 120 people now. So a 120 person meeting every single Tuesday just does not work anymore. But we use um, a communication tool called Slack, and what it is is that it's um, it's sort of like a an instant messenger where you can have different rooms for different teams or different interests. So for example, you can have a sales team room, you can have a, a marketing communications room, um, you can even have a content room. So anytime there, and we do have a content room. Um, so every time a blog goes out, every time a tweet goes out, it, there's a, an integration to that, which to me as the person who's handling social media and every tweet is seen by everybody in the company, that can be a little, um, a little <laughs> nerve wracking to say the very, to say the very least. Um, but um, it's good. It's it's a great way to get everybody on board. They can scroll at any time if they don't, you know, open up a new tab. They can just hop into our communication tool and then look and see, you know, what kind of tweets are out there, what blogs are being posted today. So that's one. So in our communications tool, um, also we have a weekly email that goes out about very high level related company stuff. So are we going to have a very important guest who's in the office? Um, are we, you know, is there a big event that the company is hosting? Um, and then usually their content at the very bottom of the email has all of the posts from the week, the blog posts, it could be an ebook release um, that has its own place in that weekly email that goes out to everybody. Um, and then also, uh, every big team, so marketing, sales, engineering, um, all of those teams has one weekly email update that goes out to the company. So they get a little bit more gritty in the, the details of, um, you know, what were some of the big wins? What were some of the losses for the week? Um, so marketing usually has its own, um, its own email and sometimes we'll include really big content pieces there. So that works out really well. So those three big pieces, um, if people don't know what content's coming out, um, they must be living under a rock. Um, they might be asleep at their desk. I have no idea. Just kidding. Um, but yeah, we try as hard as possible to make sure that um, everybody knows which content is out there and how to share it. So um, awesome. Um, we had a couple of great questions from the one and only Nick Borelli. Um, so Kristen, you mentioned Sprout Social. So is anybody using enterprise social media? And if so, what are you using? How is it working out for you? Um, if you guys could share. Um, I mean, we use a bunch of stuff for social media, for social tools. Um, we do use we do use Sprout Social and we use Bamboo, which is uh, kind of like a brother, sister of it um, in, some, in some form. We use definitely a lot of tools. Uh, but we also use this tool that is based out of France. It's called Social Dynamite. Um, and that's kind of, I, I would say, maybe more on an enterprise level for social media. Um, it's a larger tool that allows you to, yes, schedule your posts, but you also have the opportunity to have ambassadors um, that you can add. So it doesn't have to just be internal people. It can be external people, partners that you work with. If you have like great integration partner or uh, barters or, or what have you, or associations that you have really great relationships with, you can kind of put them into your, into your schedule of, of retweeting what you post, what you push out. Um, it also has the function to create a little micro blog. So I like to think of it um, kind of like, 
know, it's micro ball. It's 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 a little bit more advanced than scoop it or or something like that, where you actually can write the post. So if it's something external, you still get kind of views on your own page and have your own branding there, and can push stuff out that way. So we use a couple of those tools. And I mean, there's a there's a few other I'm sure few others I'm sure we'll mention later on. But um, I'm curious to hear what kind of you guys use and what's what's worked really well. I mean, internally. Um, we're a small team as well. So we're, we're probably at right at where social tables is at 120 now globally. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of just use a couple of, you know, file sharing tools and we use Skype a lot um, okay. internationally. It just is really helpful, I think, to talk to different people in the in your team in your area. Um, but I'm curious to hear what you guys kind of use on an, what you think for an enterprise level. Cool. Uh, we actually use HubSpot Enterprise uh, for a lot of different functions yes. and including social scheduling, like scheduling social posts and monitoring. And actually, I've also come to really enjoy using the native, I know it's blasphemy, but the native um, platform itself to monitor things um, in conjunction. So it's, you know, I do monitor all the stuff, but we have a team, so other people will, you know, occasionally check in and make sure things are all covered. So I feel comfortable having each platform open natively. And we'll do a lot of scheduling with HubSpot and a lot of work to measure our reach and see what people prefer to share and talk about, uh, which is great. But lately, um, you know, these social platforms have it in their best interest to make you dependent on the native solution, which is why Twitter has pulled the number of shares um, happen, like mm -hmm. showing up on, on blog posts and, and why their reporting tools are very granular, but then you try and look at it when it's being pulled in a third party software and it might not be as, as complete. Um, so, that, that's that's what we use. HubSpot is great for scheduling. It's very flexible for us, and we can have a calendar that's months out. Um, and then also really important, easily pause the posts because unfortunately there are some sad world events that happen where you know posting about event planning tips is inappropriate, or mm -hmm. there's a really amazing moment that is unpredictable, and you kind of want to ride the wave of timely uh, contextual posts. And so a shared post is like a scheduled post wouldn't make sense either. So that's something to look for. And then in terms of when we're looking at metrics, we're using HubSpot's reporting on reach, uh, which you can compare to previous months, which is great that historical data is really important. And like day-to-day -day mentions and engagement, it's kind of a mix of HubSpot and the platform, the native platform. Yeah, Great. I totally agree with that. You, I, I love actually having all of the native platforms up and looking at them. We use so many scheduling tools and we're actually moving to HubSpot. Um, oh, but right. I think it's great actually looking at it. And I like doing the same thing, looking at it in real time if I'm not the one posting it and kind of seeing what's kind of. What did you use before? Before, before uh, HubSpot? Yeah. Before HubSpot, we were just using um, the marketing oh, okay. automation tool, Silverpot. Okay. Okay. So we didn't have anything that was at a huge level. So that's why I'm really excited yeah. that one side of our team was moving over to HubSpot. And I was really jazzed, yeah. I guess I, <laughs> I could say, because there were so many other great content things that were going to be a part of that yeah. now that I can really utilize. Yeah, yeah. So awesome. you'll like it, I think. I'm excited. I have yet to try HubSpot. <laughs> I might, we might give it a spin. Who knows? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's great. It's, <laughs> right? I mean, they all have their uh, weak side, mm -hmm. but HubSpot's great. It is a hub, literally, you know, as the name <laughs> implies. <laughs> um, Alex Plaxon had a really great question here. Um, how much do you all focus on engaging your audience one on one? Great question. Um, Christian, I just spoke, so feel free. Okay. <laughs> I'll say, um, we probably don't do it enough as we should. Um, just, just personally, it's a goal for us for this year to do it a lot more, to engage with people in the conversations on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Uh, we, we were really active on LinkedIn um, in the earlier part of 2015 and being really engaging um, within groups and answering questions, not even ones that are just asking about, you know, from a software perspective, but just really kind of getting involved with the community. And one thing that we want to do this year is, is kind of, 
create that little community um, within within our our Twitter community. I think it's a great place to start, um, but also on Instagram as well. So I would say it's something that's going to get a much larger focus from us. Um, it's not something that we do to totally. 100% well right now. And there are a lot of people that do it well, and I admire them. And I know both of both of your teams are are pretty good at responding to stuff. So I think it's getting more involved in the conversations. And with a with a little bit of a larger team now, it's something that we actually can do that someone can spend the time and do that. So I'm, I'm excited to kind of get that going and as well. Yeah. Um, I, fortunately for us, I mean, it's always been something we've kind of emphasized and we a big part of my morning is engaging with each and every one of those people, um, and I've seen a lot of of great performance increases as a result because there's really, you know, gratification that people get from saying, "Hey, seeing thanks for sharing and a and a heart or a retweet or answering a question that was asked." Um, so, in terms of engaging with people who become evangelists or promoters, we we have we're pretty good at that, and also you know our customers really are very active on social media. Whether it's sharing our content or you know asking questions about the pieces specifically to their audience, or you know asking for their event to be promoted um, to our platform and media inquiries and all that. So that's something that we've really emphasized. And the for us the challenge comes in what do you do on the off hours it's easier to respond mm -hmm. make it a part of your daily schedule but what do you do on a friday night when you know it's hard to have a we don't have not none of us have a big team i'm sure and it's hard to kind of coordinate that so it's there's a lot of shared responsibility in that case and uh, we actually also use slack so that's a good place to coordinate and say hey you've got it today tonight and i'll take it tomorrow and and so on, but so we kind of have come up with on an off hours an owner by the day um, to kind of make sure someone's on top of it. But it is it 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 really helps, and the community responds well to that. That's great. Um, How does so social day work here? Actually, yeah, because, I'll, I'll chime in here. So as a community manager, it's sort of a title that a lot of people don't quite understand, right? Just yet. Um, so really what the community manager is charged with doing is um, really cultivating those relationships online and off. So online via social content, things like that. And then um, also offline. So through events, meeting people and building those one on one connections. So I would say one of the pillars of building community is you start really small and you do a lot of things that don't uh, scale very well. So great example is sending somebody, if somebody had a really, really poor experience with maybe your software or your website, um, or somebody had a really great experience, it goes both ways, um, sending them a handwritten note. Um, that surprisingly gets a huge rise. People will email you back, they'll call you, um, you know, so that's something that is really, really unique, and it's that one-to-one -one connection. Um, I feel like I talk about this every time I'm on a webinar, but I love him, he's amazing. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk, the granddaddy of social media, um, he has a really great book called Jab, 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 Right Hook. And the whole premise of social media and community management is that you know when you have a big ask, that's not what you lead up to. It's all of those little touches up into that point. So David, to your point, um, you know, actually going into Twitter, favoriting a tweet or thanking somebody for sharing, you know, it could have been really easy just hitting retweet, but actually going in there and responding to them and saying, thank you so much for resharing. Um, that has a lot more weight, I think, than just sitting there and ignoring it. Um, it takes, I mean, we're all on social media. We know how immediate it is to just retweet or favorite or respond to somebody. So it, it really behooves us as content and event marketers to, to give our customers and our audience and community that. So um, awesome. So we are actually running up on time here. We have about three more minutes. Um, thank you to everyone for joining in today. This has been a really, really great conversation. Um, we will send over all of the resources that we mentioned today um, in the recap blog. So um, hang tight for those resources. Um, Kristen and David, um, do you have any last minute things you'd like to share with the audience? 
and for where sure. can people we'll find you online? And then, um, yeah, if you want to share a Twitter handle or your email address. Yeah, um, I mean, I hope everybody gained something out of this. We're all kind of in the B2B space, so, but I think event planners can really utilize a lot of the stuff that we've been that we've been talking about um, because content plays a huge part in in how you promote your events and how you create a kind of a lifelong event community because I think content can expand the life of your event and I think that's a huge thing to take away. There's a lot of these great pieces that you can create. We talked a lot about how we manage it and how we put it together and how we use and utilize them for our team. But I think a really big thing is just to remember that content shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be something that you're thinking about from the preprint pre-planning stages to during and even after, because I think after it could have a huge impact um, because you don't want people to forget about your event if you only host that one big, huge annual event. You want them to remember it. So constantly following up with some great communication is really vital. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I really hope everyone's getting something out of this. And I think the wrap up post is gonna be awesome and have a lot of great information in it from all of us, I'm sure. Um, my my personal Twitter handle is the one that I used here. Um, and then my company's is eTouches at eTouches. And you can find our blog at blog.etouches.com where we share a lot of great pieces. And if you just joined, like we both said in the beginning, it's blogs are our baby. So <laughs> go and read the content that we have on there and share it with your community as well. Um, for me, first of all, thank you all for watching. Um, I know dedicating an hour or a couple, even a couple of minutes is a, ch a challenge, especially on a Wednesday. So thank you very much. Hopefully you learned something new. I know I certainly did. So it was a pleasure getting to talk to you both. Um, and thank you to Laura and Will for setting all of this up. Um, I, in terms of like event planning tips, we didn't necessarily cover everything there. So one resource that's great, at least from Bizabo, is if you go to bizabo.com slash playbook, there's a really awesome uh, ebook that we spent a lot of time writing and making look really beautiful. So you can check that out. Um, and there will be a lot of other resources in the wrap up, including that uh, uh, case study that I mentioned. So check out that as well. Great. Um, and this is Laura Lopez from Social Table signing off. Um, thank you both again for signing on for today's session. Um, for anybody who enjoyed today's session, uh, Will Curran of Endless Entertainment, he does this every single week at 5 p.m. Eastern, um, and he has a whole slew of event technology, event professionals that are just leaders in their industry and space. Um, so if you liked today's session, I encourage you to tune in to next week, um, and the guests will be to be determined. Um, we'll, we'll shoot those out um, in just a few. So. Thank you again, everybody, for tuning in, um, and have a good rest of your night. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. If you guys want to hang on for a post-show um, recap, that will okay. be good. Okay. We'll do it. Cool. All right.